to uh, Meg Langley. Meg got her Master of Science from the University of Montana, and uh, she's an in independent biologist and teacher. And today she's going to tell us what she's found out about uh, a small population of bighorn sheep in British Columbia. Meg, are you there and can you share your screen? I can see you. I think you're muted. Okay, looking good. I still can't hear you, but I don't know if you've been saying anything. Can you hear me now? Yes, fine. Go ahead. Great. Well, thank you kindly for that introduction, Marco. Good morning, everyone. Bienvenue à tout le monde. My name's Margaret Langley, or Meg Langley, and I'd like to thank the Northern Wild Sheep and Goat Council for this opportunity to share this work, which was done with the intention of helping to conserve what is already a very small herd of Rocky Mountain bighorn sheep. It's on a much smaller scale than most of what I've heard this week, but has led to some interesting findings. I'd like to acknowledge that this study was done on the unceded territory of the Tanaha and Sikshwemek nations, and to thank the Columbia Shushwap Regional District and Public Conservation Assistance Fund for financial assistance, plus the Town of Golden, Tourism Golden, and Wildsite Golden for their support. This work relied heavily on many previous studies, plus the work of numerous professionals who completed fecal analysis and explanations along the way, and the volunteers who shared their enthusiasm and interest. Thank you all. Male Rocky Mountain bighorn sheep are pictured frequently, likely because of their heavily weighted heads. Few places offer such easy access to photographers as the Kicking Horse Canyon, just east of Golden, British Columbia, where sheep are regularly seen on or near the Trans-Canada, sauntering down the highway and across the 10-mile bridge or bedded down for a snack of grain dumped in a pullout. Needless to say, they are an intriguing and shrinking herd limited by various factors. Prior to the 1980s, there was no resident herd in the Kicking Horse Canyon, although lone sheep were seen occasionally, especially north of Golden. A small group showed up in 1986, the same year as an intense snow dump, and they found themselves essentially stuck in the narrow canyon with the town and the Columbia River on one end and the Kicking Horse River and dense forest on the other. Their starvation seemed likely and members of the Golden Rod and Gun Club began a winter supplemental feeding program that would last for 29 years until 2015. The herd grew and by 2007, there were more than 50 sheep in conflicts with the highway were increasing. In hopes of reducing these conflicts and augmenting other declining populations, 32 sheep were corralled and relocated in the late 2000s. Unfortunately, the success rates observed were low, perhaps because of a substantial change in elevation. In 2016, I began what had become almost daily drives from Golden to the Five Mile Bridge, seven kilometers away. Initially, I counted and sexed and aged and filmed and watched from a respectful distance and using my trusty Zoom camera. In 2016, I counted 14 sheep. In 2018, I counted 12, with one to two yearlings each year. In 2019, I set out to evaluate what was limiting this herd, learning what I could using non-invasive methods. My first thought was what the that was that the herd might be inbred, giving their isolated location and history. Maybe only inbred sheep would think they could hold back an 18 wheeler and perhaps deformed fetuses were the explanation for the low lamb numbers. Or maybe the lure of minerals and food close to the road were the explanation for their bold yet seemingly self-destructive behavior. In search of answers, fecal samples were collected and analyzed for inbreeding, diet quality, parasite load, cortisol level by various labs in Canada and the US as seen on this slide. March was very cold in 2019, which aided in collection of samples 
as did the ability to return to where the sheep had been recently seen. Though sometimes distinctive, sheep excrement can look very much like it came from a deer. So only samples that were unquestionably from bighorn sheep were collected. As there did not appear to be many yearlings, I watched closely to evaluate lambing success and survival, observing and filming daily before, during, and after lambing season. This also allowed me to establish critical habitats, including the principal lambing area and early spring ranges. Desirable habitat features for bighorn sheep have been identified in studies to inform improved relocation success. The quality of the current range was evaluated using these features and use was assessed based on sighting frequency and observed browsing. Possible habitat enhancement options were considered and the public was engaged to insist in recording observations of both dead and live wildlife on the highway. The study area was defined based on topography and hundreds of sheep sightings. The Kicking Horse River forms the southern boundary and the CP rail line parallels and crosses the river. Between 100 to 150 meters above the river runs the Trans-Canada Highway, built in 1952. The vegetated areas of the canyon are dominated by dug fir with patches of deciduous trees and shrubs. Much of the study area has a slope over 45 degrees and the highway corridor covers almost 20% of the 620 hectare or 6.2 square kilometer area. Because of the steepness of the region, if the sheep were not frequently near the road, poop collection would have been very challenging. But as things are, I've been able to access areas where sheep have recently been without risking my life. Getting samples to the labs, however, especially fresh ones, was challenging as 24-hour delivery does not exist from Golden, BC. However, the results were worth it. Genetic analysis was completed by Sam Deacon from Dr. Coltman's lab at the University of Alberta using the same 13 microsatellites that he referred to in his talk yesterday. An additional 15 loci were analyzed by Wildlife Genetics International in Nelson, BC. The results indicated that although the herd has only one to four alleles <clears throat> per locus, far fewer than found for Alberta sheep, they have relatively high individual heterozygosity with a mean value of 0.64 across the 28 loci sampled. All but one of the loci analyzed were thought to be neutral, this one being MMP9, which has been looked at in correlation with lung tissue repair by Lucard et al. in 2008. At eight of the 28 loci, including MMP9, observed heterozygosity was over 0.8, and the mean value for all 28 loci was 0.66. Based on this, inbreeding does not appear to be a concern unless the low numbers of alleles are indicative of problematic reduced variability. The high diversity observed may result from interchange with the much larger radium herd to which the golden herd was found to be most similar based on a principal component analysis, also completed by Sam Deacon. You can see the Alberta herds on the left side of this figure, whereas the golden and radium herds are shown on the right and are much closer. Other notable results included low diaminopimelic acid, also known as DAPA, and indicative of consumed forage digestibility, low percent fecal nitrogen, a high prevalence of unidentified dorsal spine larvae, and the establishment of a baseline for cortisol level, which has a wide range and relatively high values relative to those reported in other studies. In addition, seven gastrointestinal parasites were detected, though none in high numbers. These preliminary results point towards a low quality diet. Going forward, it will be worthwhile to complete molecular identification of the species of dorsal spine larvae found and to continue with cortisol level analysis. So what about recruitment? There are six adult ewes, so there should be more than one or two additions to the herd each year. 
At first, it seemed like few lambs were being born, but then at least four and then five lambs were born in 2019 and 2020, respectively. In 2019, two of the four lambs survived. And in 2020, two of the five lambs born in June are still alive at the present time. Two of the three dead lambs in 2020 are confirmed highway mortalities. And it seems surprising that more are not killed, especially on the one and a half kilometer drop down to the river where drivers pick up speed. Sometimes the habitats selected by the golden sheep make me wonder. Looking more closely at these places points to their value to sheep for escape terrain, minerals, food, and water. The lambing area, though small, offers what sheep are looking for despite its proximity to the Trans-Canada and the railroad, though by fall there is very little forage left. This picture is of the lambing area. It does extend up quite a ways, but um, they use these lower cliffs as well. In late winter and spring, the sheep frequently use southwest facing slopes, which are open. Ironically, the placement of highway fencing is such that the sheep have to go onto the highway in order to access these relatively open areas. The highway corridor is a much used part of the sheep's habitat, facilitating east-west travel, along with access to minerals, grain spills, and roadside vegetation. With these come other potential stressors related to human contact, the impacts of which are not clear. Efforts to objectively evaluate the quality of the habitat, specifically for bighorn sheep, indicated that while the study area is suitable in access to escape terrain, water, and desirable aspects, it falls short in having too much human disturbance, not enough preferred plant species, being too steep for ideal winter range, and having too much cover. Unfortunately, another key quality variable, access to minerals, was not evaluated in this study, nor were the impacts of competition with other ungulates, which also use the area. So how do we enhance this place to make it easier for the herd to persist? The Ministry of Transportation has made significant efforts to keep wildlife off of the road and completed sections of the Trans-Canada. Within the western portion of the study area, there is one overpass, shown here on the top left, plus extensive fencing with exits, gates, and jump outs to allow wildlife to leave the highway corridor should they enter it through a breached fence or other means. Unfortunately, the bighorn sheep have figured out how to enter the highway corridor using these exit gates and jump outs. They've been caught on camera doing so, and once they have pried apart the tines with their horns, the passage remains open for others to follow. This short video shows a ewe passing through the gate in the wrong direction to gain access onto the highway. In time, the rest of the group will also follow. Intended fencing structures between bridges on the next section of highway development, phase four, will also employ these same exit structures. Design changes to both gates and jump outs are needed to alter these access points such that sheep can be restricted from entering the highway corridor. Although the Ministry of Transportation is working on gate and jump out designs that will enable movements in the desired directions and keep bighorn sheep away from the highway, moving fencing that restricts access to spring range will be expensive and is, and is unlikely to occur. You can see the fencing in this image here. There's a jump out there, which if they do jump up, but generally they come along the highway to access these open spring range areas. Phase four of the highway development is scheduled to begin in 2021, but there's already significantly more human activity occurring in the canyon as preparations begin. 
Fortunately, this often leads to reduced speeds and may ultimately benefit the herd. Highway mortality might also be reduced through improved signage with lighting and messaging strategically placed and increased speed limit enforcement. Highway mortality is likely the main source of loss for this herd. However, efforts to keep them away from the road must also ensure that their needs for minerals, forage and movement can be met without using the highway corridor as they currently do. Number of preferred plants coming out of the highway. A lot of stuff shown in this clip that I filmed just last night. Additionally, controlling the invasive weeds already established in the area and picking up the garbage that constantly accumulates in the canyon may also improve sheep habitat quality, such that a sign will not be all that remains of this herd in the future. This case study has allowed a close look at the situation faced by this small herd and demonstrates that this type of non-invasive work can inform case-specific management decisions. It has also led to ongoing collaboration with the Ministry of Transportation to further document use of highway exit structures by bighorn sheep and wildlife in general. I imagine that many of you have dealt with highway fencing and exit structures and may be able to share design suggestions that would benefit this herd. Ending there, I'd like to thank you very much for your interest. Merci beaucoup pour votre intérêt. I'd be happy to try and answer any questions people might have and would greatly value any input, ideas, or advice going forward. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you, Meg. And thank you for, among other things, showing us that sheep can outsmart at least some uh, road engineers. Uh -huh. uh, if uh, I'm just going to try and check if there's any questions in Q&A. Um, yes, uh, uh, do you know if uh, with the plan expansion, expansion of the Trans-Canada, uh, there is any specific uh, wild mitigation her uh, plan for this sheep herd? Um, at this time, the intended design will have several bridges that are not necessarily placed where I think is best, but they are intended to allow passage underneath the highway. Other than that, there are no plans to do any special mitigation or do anything differently. Okay, and just one last quick one. Has anybody ever considered putting saw blocks, you know, to keep them away from the highway? Would that potentially work? Yeah, I've, I've thought about that a lot and think it's probably a, a good strategy. A big gap in all of this is that we don't know where the sheep are currently accessing minerals other than the highway. There is some indication of licks in the lambing area, but um, haven't, they haven't been well documented or confirmed. So as I mentioned, ensuring that they can get at the minerals that they need once the, if they are restricted from access to the highway is going to be very important. So in, in that uh, eventuality, using salt licks may have to be done. Okay, thank you. I see there is a few other questions accumulating, which is great because uh, people can answer them later uh, on the Q&A. Uh, we'll have to stop it there because we are uh, running out of time. Uh, we are now going for a short break. I believe it's 20 minutes. Let me just check. Um, yes, 20 minute break. And then we're coming back with the behavioral ecology session. Uh, again, the first talk, unfortunately, had to be canceled so the lobby switch up by one and we'll start uh, the lunch break uh, uh, 10 minutes earlier and uh, sorry 20 minutes earlier and go for more an extra 20 minutes i'd just like to thank all the dynamic speakers of the population dynamic session and see you after the break <laughs>